Hello there. This is Sam Conan at samconan.com. Welcome to the third lesson in the Read Like a Grown-Up video course. In the last lesson, we discussed why annotation is important and what annotation symbols to use when you read. Then we actually annotated the first few pages of the story for this course, Ernest Hemingway's Big Two-Hearted River. In this lesson, we are going to learn how to make sense of our reading through analysis and a reading journal. This is the third step in the Read Like a Grown-Up method. The main goal of your reading journal is to help you decide what the author is saying. You've read and annotated in the second step, and now you need to write about what you've read in your reading journal. Your reading journal can be an actual journal or one on your computer, which is my preference. Either way, you use your journal in the exact same way. After you've read and annotated the first chapter or major section of the book, open up your reading journal and write a summary of what you've just read. To decide what you should write about, ask yourself, what is the single main idea of this book or this story? Write that down and then add other important details about the single main idea. But be careful here. You have to be careful about getting too detailed. You want to write just one paragraph for each chapter, not an entire essay. If you need an actual number, then try to limit your paragraphs to four or five sentences. The reason for this is to keep your summarizing at the right scope. Eager readers often write far too much, and they unknowingly set a precedent for themselves that they, that they can't keep up as they continue to read. Also, writing just one paragraph forces you to really home in on the main idea of the chapter. Next, when you finish your summary paragraph, you need to respond to it. Use a different color ink or a different color font if you're using a digital journal. And underneath the summary that you've just written, write down your response to what you've read. Share your insights, your reflections, your questions, agreements, disagreements, anything that you have to say about the passage that you've just read in the summary. But keep in mind that you, this is, here is where you're responding to everything you've read, not just to what you included in the summary you just wrote. If you talk about a particular passage in your response, be sure to include the page numbers to that section so you can reference it later. Now, keep writing or keep reading and annotating your way through the book, writing your response and your, your summary and your response after each section. Third, when you finish the entire book, write a single paragraph that describes the main subject of the entire book. To do this, you first want to reread all the confusing sections you marked with a question mark as you annotated. Go back to the, to the appropriate section in your reading notes and add notes in your reading journal about these questionable sections in a third color of ink. This will help you distinguish it from your original reading notes and from your summary. Then when you've commented and reread and commented on all of the confusing sections that you had, then write a single paragraph that summarizes the content of the entire book. But be careful here, as you write this summary paragraph, to focus on the theme or the central idea of the book, and not just on plot summary. If you're, if you're summarizing a novel, plot is, a, is especially important, but you really want to focus in your summary on, the, on how the theme develops through the plot, not just on reiterating, reiterating the plot itself. And again, remember, no more than four sentences. At this point, you've read and annotated the book, you've summarized in your own words every major section of the book, and you've responded to the content of each of these sections in your reading journal. You've also summarized the book's central message in your own words and thought through the passages that confused you on your initial read. And now you're ready for the final analysis of the book. The final analysis consists of three questions that you will answer in your reading journal. First question is, what is the climax of the plot or the center of the argument? What's the key moment in the story or the most important point in the argument? To help you identify the climax or the center of the argument, think through the structure of the book. What are the beginning, the middle, and the end? Also, what are the most important parts? What are the parts of this book that are indispensable? The parts that make this book what it is, the parts that would mean this, this book would be something completely different if it didn't have these parts. That's the first question. So write it down and, and write about it in your reading journal. Second, ask yourself, what did the author hope to accomplish in this story? Is the author trying to inform or persuade or give an emotional experience? What is, what is he or she trying to do or give or, or what's, the, what's, the, what's he trying to accomplish in the reader through this book? Closely tied to this is what is the central theme? What's the main thing, the main truth, the main 
message that the author wants to convey to the reader. And then the third question, the third and final question is, did the author succeed? Your answer to this question requires you to consider your own reaction to the book, and it also helps prepare you for the fourth step in reading like a grown-up. So those are the three questions. Uh, that's everything you need to do in your reading journal, the third step of the read like a grown-up method. Now I want to give you a look at how I keep my own reading journal. And I'm going to walk you through how I would complete this step, the third step in the reading process, with the Big Two-Hearted River, the Hemingway story we're using as our practice test for this course. And, there, and you can find it in the resources section below. All right, welcome back. Here is my reading journal. Uh, this is a program called Evernote. It's a phenomenal software program. You can learn more about it in the, the resources below. It's not a tutorial on Evernote. It's a tutorial on my reading journal for the Big Two-Hearted River. Now, I've actually already completed all my notes for the Big Two-Hearted River. Here it is. And I'm uh, what I want to do, uh, this is available in the resources section down below. You can see everything that I uh, have to say about the Big Two-Hearted River. Um, but what we're going to do, what we're going to be doing is uh, walking through how I get that, how I get my notes together. So what here is uh, the beginning of, of my notes on the Big Two-Hearted River. Uh, I use a template, actually, and so that's why this is up here. I'm not going to fill that in right now. I'll do that later. Um, but the first thing I want to do is I've read part one of the story, and so now I need to summarize what part one is about. And so in part one, I'm simply going to write a paragraph about what this, what this is about. And so I would write something along these lines. Uh, I'm going to focus on... Um, the, the trauma that Nick has suffered, uh, that he needs, he's try, hoping to find healing for, how he connects to the black grasshoppers, how he has been burned over as well, and he's matched his surroundings and he wants to find some kind of healing. Uh, I'm going to talk about, I, I talk in here about the making of the camp and the meal at the very end of part one. It's probably the most important section. It's certainly the most important section in part one, maybe in the whole story. And so that's that's what I write. Now, after I've written a summary of part one, I want to write down my response to part one. And I do this in a different color ink so that I can separate I can separate my thoughts, my response from the book, from my summary of what the author is saying. So I like to use green ink for this. Uh, I also use these uh, dash marks at the beginning of each thought. I actually don't write full paragraphs. I just write these. And some things that are that really stand out to me in part one, there's this, this question that I have is... Uh, Nick is really happy when he watches the trout. When he watches the trout at Sini, and then later in part two, he's really happy about. He, he makes lots of connections between himself and the trout. And so I'm wondering if there's more, if there's more there um, between Nick and the trout, and why he feels so much joy just watching them. The other thing I talk about is is all of the sacramental imagery in the at the end of part one when Nick makes uh, makes his his camp. His tent is, is really a chapel of sanctuary. He says it's a good place where, where nothing could get him or nothing could come at him. Um, after he eats his dinner, um, which is red food and bread, it causes him to exclaim, Christ, Jesus Christ, at the first taste. And that, that's pretty significant, even from in a Hemingway story, especially after Nick has vowed that he's not going to say anything else for the rest of the time he's out there because his voice sounds odd in the wilderness. His first bite of this delicious meal, this goodness, causes him to invoke the incarnational name. And that seems fairly significant. But most significant, at the very end of his meal, he makes coffee according to Hopkins. Now that sounds very much that according to Hopkins, a very odd phrase, when he says according to Hopkins, reminds us of the gospel according to Mark or the gospel according to John. And so it seems that, that Hemingway is deliberately describing how Nick is is creating his own rituals, his own sacraments, to try to regain or reconnect his future, or his, his present, I guess, his present crisis, with his good past, the memories that he has of his friends, uh, fishing, uh, camping, his experiences in the outdoors. Uh, those are all good memories he had in the past, and then there was a death of some sort, a death of his innocence, a death of his... Um, of his of his understanding of the good life that separates has separated him from his past, and he's trying to reconnect those through deliberate incarnational and ritualized uh, sacraments. 
Uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. So there are my res- there's my response, and now I want to go on and uh, and do the same thing for part two. So I write down my responses to part two after after I read it. I write down my responses, and I notice uh, just you can read this later. But I, I talk about how um, Nick's day on the river, given all the sacramental imagery in part one, we would expect that part two has to do with. Uh, with baptism, perhaps, that Nick's time in the river, his immersion in the river, somehow is going to bring him new life or a, a sense of recreation, a new start. But what we do find, what we find is when he goes fishing, he does have a good time fishing. He catches lots of great fish. But there are also many images of death, drowning grasshoppers, fungus killed trout, an image after Nick guts his, the two trout that he, he has, he field dresses them. But then he, he comments that they look, st- they still look alive. Uh, even though they're very obviously dead. And then there's that final threatening image of the swamp that makes Nick stop fishing altogether. And so what we realize at the end of the story is that though Nick expected to have the river somehow heal him or uh, create him anew, connect himself to his past, instead he really finds that um, that perhaps there really is no good place, even in the, even in the reliable river, this place that he creates that's um, that uh, is free from evil. He suddenly realizes that he can't escape death and threat no matter where he goes. And so, at the very end of the story, Nick's sacramental river reveals its own two hearts. It gives life and it takes life away, and Nick has to decide whether he can say, "Blessed be the name of the river," or not. So there's my summary, and then I would add my own response. A couple things that I want to focus here, I focus on here in my response. I'm actually going to make this bigger so that you can see it a little more clearly. Two things here. Uh, there's a connection, again, between Nick and, and the grasshoppers. Um, he uses the grasshoppers to catch fish, and so I have a question here. Is, is, are we supposed to make something of that? Nick sacrificing uh, other other creatures who are similar to him for the sake of getting his own healing. I'm not sure there's anything there that Hemingway means uh, to be saying, but I put the question down just in case I think of it, I I think of a connection later. Also, there are, um, there are several uh, questions that we, several descriptions as we go through part two, several details that Hemingway includes that makes us really wonder at the end, whether, whether Nick's substituted sacrament is effective does he actually get new life from the river, or does he find does he find something else? And then the last uh, point that I make in terms of my response is just Nick's Nick's reaction to the river. The words he uses are significant. He says it would be a tragic fishing in the swamp would be tragic, a tragic adventure. Um, and the story ends with another mention of the swamp. He talks about how. You know, if, he's, if he was going to fish in the in the swamp, he would have to crawl on his belly or wade up to his armpits. So I include a lot of those details in my in my own response because I know those details are important if I'm ever going to write about um, this story again or or even just come back to it and, and try to explain my reading of the story. Those details are important. So there is my summary and response for part one and part two. The next thing I want to do is add. Um, what I call I call it quick summary, which is just my response to the entire book or my summary of what the entire story is about. Now a lot of this text I've already written, and so I just look back over my notes for part one and part two, and I come up with a nice, a short four paragraph, uh, sorry four sentence paragraph that summarizes what this story is about in terms of how its theme develops through the plot. You can take a look at that again uh, in, in the notes below. So there's my quick summary and my my response uh, and summary for part one and part two. The next thing I want to do is come down to the bottom of my reading notes, and I want to do the final analysis. And there are three questions to the final analysis. We're going to write um, write them down. We're going to write our notes about the final analysis down here at the end of our reading journal. There are three questions that we ask when we do final analysis, and the first one. Is is to find the climax of the plot. That's the first. That's the first thing we have to do. What is the climax of the plot? Um, because we're reading fiction, that's the question. If we we're reading nonfiction, it would be what's the center of the argument? What's the central point? We also want to know to help. Other some other questions here to help us answer this. What's the beginning, middle, and end? And what are the most important parts? 
Well, in my reading of this story, the climax of this of the plot is when Nick sets up camp. That's when he finds the peace that he sought, and he has high expectations for the following day. The, the tragic ending, that last image of the swamp, causes us to rethink the, the camp scene, which only helps us to understand that that's really the most important part of, or that's the climax of the plot. We're really hopeful for Nick that he's found the peace that he is seeking, um, and we're hopeful that the story is going to end out, is going to turn out as a comedy and not a tragedy. In terms of the beginning, middle, and end, uh, I think the, the beginning, very simply, is the statement of Nick's crisis. When he sees that he's similar to the black grasshopper, the middle is the setting up of the camp when he finds his good place and finds peace. And the end, of course, is when Nick's, day, uh, Nick's fishing fails, uh, fails to provide lasting peace. It's when Nick realizes that there is no good place and there's no place he can go where nothing can touch him. And for this story, the th- most important parts are also the three parts I've just mentioned that, that correspond to the beginning, the middle, and the end. The second question we ask in final analysis is why the author wrote the story. What's he trying to accomplish? Is he trying to inform? Is he trying to entertain? Or is he trying to give us an emotional experience? For this story, I really think that Hemingway is trying to communicate an emotional experience. He's trying to give us a sense of dislocation, why Nick seems to be so um, separated, not only from society, but also from himself, from his own past. And that's what he's trying to communicate through this through this story. The, the theme is closely connected to this, and, and I think the theme has to do with the, just the, the recognition that there really is no completely good place. There really are no utopias. There's no, there aren't any good places that death can't touch. And the best thing that we can do in this life is to build the best places we possibly can, knowing that they're going to be flawed and flimsy. We try anyway. I think that's what Hemingway is trying to get at in this story. Third, we at the third question we ask is whether Hemingway succeeded. Was he successful in communicating this theme to us? And I think, of course, because I'm giving you the story as the test case, uh, the, the text for this class, I think it's very clear that he did succeed. And one of the reasons I think it succeeds is simply because of Hemingway's style. He doesn't preach at us. He doesn't try to teach us anything. He doesn't bend bend or, or misuse symbol or, or bend the, the plot in order to get to his point. In fact, he makes us empathize with Nick pretty quickly because of the joy that Nick feels in simple things, like the canvas, the smell of the canvas tent, canned spaghetti, uh, the trout on the end of his line. And that empathy also makes us feel a sense, we feel Nick's irrational fear when he looks at the swamp. We don't know what it is about the swamp that's making Nick so afraid, but we start feeling the same kind of anxiety and fear. I also think that Hemingway succeeds in this story at communicating a reality of human life, that ritual is inescapable. It's Humans are going to make sacraments, they're going to make rituals, they're going to make liturgies, no matter where they go. It's it's ironic. It's it's really telling that Nick feels so so disconnected from his community, so isolated that he has to go uh, go commune with nature in order to find himself again. But as soon as he's in nature, he creates for himself a community. He carves out of the wilderness this little space where he puts his camp. He he um, he uses trees to set up camp. He he starts a fire. He uses water from the river. He finds a place, the grasshopper log, where he can find bait for the rest of the time he's there. He goes into nature and civilizes it. And as soon as he set up his camp, he begins instituting rituals and liturgies to help him make to help him uh, find his place in this new space that he's made for himself, to, to help himself relate to his surroundings. And that's an inescapable function of humanity. Uh, and, and for Nick, those rituals are extremely important. Um, to fight against what one poet has called the dying of the light, to fight against the sense of, of threat and danger that the world brings us all over the place. And so um, even though Nick can't, inev- can't postpone, he can't uh, escape the day where he has to go and fish the swamp, where he, has to, he actually has to look into the face of death. He can't postpone that day, but the rituals help him to deal with it. They help him to give it meaning or to help position it somehow in his life. 
And so Hemingway's story, I think, is very successful because of all of those things. Uh, he communicates it very well. He makes us realize that we are Nick. We're rooting for him, that Nick is not some um, particular quirky, very odd character, but he is us. Nick is an everyman, and um, we feel we feel his pain. We feel his fear. And uh, we also realize that for us to rage against the dying of the light, we need to carve out the best places we can in our own communities. So that's the, that wraps up this tutorial. There are a couple other things in my notes that you can download. Uh, so now let's go back. Let's go back and talk about your lesson or your homework for next week. Thanks for joining me for the third video in the Read Like a Grown-Up video course. Before you go on to watch the fourth video, be sure you do the following. First, start your own reading journal with the Big Two-Hearted River. To do that, either use a, a normal, ordinary uh, paper journal or start one online. Go download Evernote and, uh, and start uh, using that software for all it's worth. But whatever, whatever format you use for your reading journal, here's how you start. You've already read the story, so now write a summary and response for part one. Then do the same thing for part two. And when you've completed both of those, then go on and write your summary paragraph for the whole story. Now, some of your analysis will probably be affected by my analysis, but feel free to agree or disagree with me in your story. Just have a good reason for it, and then write down your own thoughts and your own words in your reading journal. Second, after you've done your responses and summaries, then ask the final analysis questions about the big two-hearted river. And those two questions to review are, that are these. What was Hemingway trying to accomplish in this story? Did he succeed? Why or why not? And this, the, the first question is actually about, um, about the major parts. Um, so go back and, and, and take a look at those as well. Third, remember that if you have any questions at any time, you can email me and I'll have an answer for you in 24 hours. And now that you're three lessons into the course, I'd really appreciate if you could send feedback to me, any feedback you have about the course, uh, things that I could do to improve it, things I left out, um, or you can just say, hey, thanks. Thanks for making such a great resource available for us. I'd love to hear from you, and I look forward to, talk to talking with you then. Next time, our fourth and final lesson, applying your reading. We'll talk about how to bring all of your reading and thinking together in one place and how to apply it in ways that actually change your life. Once again, if this video is helpful, take a minute and tell someone else about the course. In the resources section below, there are social media links. Use them to share the link to the sign-up page for this course with your friends and family. Thanks a bunch. Until next time, here's to your reading life.